Ich muss doch schon finden, ich brauche doch das Mikrofon. Dear comrades and friends, I welcome you to the election campaign meeting of the Socialist Equality Party here in Berlin on the topic Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Egypt Political Lessons. For the first time we have such an election meeting as an international online meeting many friends in Germany and other countries are participating. There are over a hundred participants and we assume that... So I welcome everybody in Europe, in the US, in Australia, Sri Lanka or wherever you are in front of your monitors following this meeting. I also welcome our speaker, Comrade Johannes Stern, everybody who reads the WSWS and I assume that this is the large majority of our listeners. Of course, no Johannes. He is the author who from the beginning, from day one, of the mass uprising in Egypt reported for the WSWS. He has written many reports and analysis of the events in Egypt. And to explain to the readers of the WSWS what is happening in Egypt, we are very glad to welcome Johannes here and we are looking forward to his lecture. We have been asked frequently why our first election meeting starting the election campaign in Germany, why do we start with Egypt? And the answer is very simple. The events in Egypt are of enormous international significance. They have an immediate effect on the politics in every country and they contain extremely important political experiences for the working class internationally in every country. Here in our election campaign in Germany all sorts of unimportant things are being discussed. In the media there is a real sort of a campaign to um, just cover all the real issues. For example, the uh, a candidate of the SPD, Steinbruck, is speaking in football stadiums because uh, a, a football player has uh, evaded tax 
and they are trying to create a huge uh, campaign about this uh, totally unimportant event. There could one could name hundreds uh, such maneuvers and uh, really this campaign serves to keep the population uninformed and while at the same time huge events are taking place which are of enormous historical significance and enormous attacks are being prepared against the working class. With our election campaign we oppose this kind of policies of the bourgeoisie. We take very important international events and place them in the center of our campaign and we speak to an international audience. For us this entire question of the international orientation of our party and our politics is of decisive significance. What is really important this weekend is the preparation of war against Syria. The Pentagon and the American government are driving towards a military intervention and the military government in Egypt of course plays an essential role in this preparation of war against Syria. At the same time the war against Syria is taking place under different conditions than the war against Iraq ten years ago. There has begun a revolution in the region which has not been oppressed yet by the military regime in Cairo. When two and a year, half years ago the Mubarak regime was overthrown this created a shock throughout the European governments and even though the dictator has now been released from prison this does not mean that everything is back to normal. It's not a sort of reset, everything is starting at zero. <coughs> the Egyptian revolution has opened up a new stage in the international development of the working class it is a new stage of world socialist revolution which has started and events in Egypt have made clear that the international economic crisis leads to enormous attacks on the working class which provoke resistance which has revolutionary implications. This is the reason why the events in Egypt are discussed everywhere in the back rooms of politicians and media but not openly. In the last week we had an interview date with the Berlin uh, television and radio. It's a public channel. We were invited to their studio. They interview all small parties and one of their first questions was do you believe that a revolutionary uprising like in Egypt is possible in Germany too. And we were, in the first moment, we were surprised about this question. We immediately said yes. We believe that such a development is coming and that the enormous social polarization in this country and the attacks being prepared by the coming government will provoke massive resistance and will create a revolutionary situation. Another example, if you walk through Berlin and other countries, you have the central po election poster of the left party which has in huge letters revolution question mark and then below they say no and they put forward all sorts of uh, reformist demands which they oppose to revolution. Why are they doing that? This poster is not directed towards the electorate but it is directed towards the ruling elite in order to tell them if you want to oppress a revolution you need the left party. We are the experts. 22 years ago 
when there was the great struggle about the reintroduction of capitalism in the East, we were the ones who prevented a socialist development and a revolutionary development of the working class. The left party makes clear that the turn to the right of the pseudo-left in Egypt is an international phenomenon. This is an essential part of the lecture we are going to hear by uh, Comrade Johannes Stern. I'm looking forward to his lecture and I think this will provide the basis for a discussion. Just a brief remark on our meeting today as an international online meeting. It is important that we establish certain rules. First I would ask everybody not to interrupt uh, the lecture. If you have questions, uh, those in the room and also those participating online, be it at home or in a cafe, if you have questions, please hand them in. Those of you who are not in this room should can type their question during the lecture. Uh, please, please feel free to type in your question during the lecture and then we will take them up when the lecture has ended. If there is more discussion, uh, please um, turn off your mobile phones because they disturb transmission. It is the first time we are holding this kind of meeting. I ask you to be considerate. Um, if this is uh, successful, then we open up a new stage of our international work. And I think that this is very important. Thank you very much, uh, your Comrade Johannes. Dear Uli, thank you for your introduction. I welcome all comrades and listeners. Uh, thank you for attending the lecture and participating in the discussion. The release of Hosni Mubarak a couple of days ago from prison symbolizes the counter-revolutionary development in Egypt since the military coup of Langsamer, langsamer, langsamer. On the 3rd of July, on Thursday, Mubarak was brought from the Torah prison in Cairo into a military hospital. He is being protected by special units of the police and the Egyptian military in order to protect him from the people. More than two and a half years after the beginning of the Egyptian revolution and the overthrow of Mubarak, the military rulers try to rehabilitate their ex-leader. Many representatives of the old regime are back in their positions of power. The um, uh, oppression of Mubarak are back, is back. In, during the past weeks, thousands of protesters were killed by the military and the security forces. They were injured and imprisoned. The transitional government is discussing to officially ban the Muslim Brotherhood as during Mubarak. More than half of the leading cadre of the Muslim Brothers, among them the overthrown President Mohammed Mursi, is now in prison. Behind the oppression of the Muslim Brotherhood is the aim of the junta to end all strikes and protests of the Egyptian workers and to prepare new attacks on the working class. On Sunday last week, the army and the police attacked a sit-in strike of more than 2,000 steelworkers in Suez. And um, imprisoned the strike leaders. The government, the military government is working on plans to cut subsidies for bread and fuel something millions of poor millions are dependent on. 
This is a picture of the striking workers in Suez, which was attacked last week by the military. This makes clear that the coup was a preventive blow against the Egyptian working class, which was the driving force behind the revolution. Before the intervention of the military, millions of workers were on the streets and squares throughout Egypt in order to demonstrate against Morsi and the Muslim Brotherhood and for the aims of the revolution, that is, better living conditions, jobs, higher wages, and more democratic and social rights. These are the same demands which were in the center of the protests on the 25th of January 2011. This is the photo of the Tahrir Square on the first day of the protests. The worker is carrying a sign uh, in Arabic which says no to hunger, unemployment and torture. If you look at the development during the past weeks, it appears that the wheel of history has been turned back to the time before January 25th, 2011. How has it become possible that counter-revolution after two years of bitter struggles now is again on the rise? Who is politically responsible? And what is the stage the Egyptian revolution is in and what political lessons and tasks have to be drawn? These are decisive questions confronting the working class in Egypt and internationally and this is the subject of my lecture. Comrade Uli has pointed to the international and historical significance of the Egyptian revolution. The revolution in Egypt, which began on the 25th of January 1911, announces, despite all its political problems, a new stage of world socialist revolution. Twenty years after the dissolution of the Soviet Union and the capitalist uh, triumph about the end of history, the working class has to return as the most powerful social force. The old uh, saying of Marx and Engels that the history of all society is the history of class struggles has been vindicated in Egypt in a powerful manner. From the beginning the working class has been the driving force of Egyptian revolution. The great Russian revolutionary and leader of the October Revolution, Leo Trotsky, in his a history of the Russian Revolution characterized the revolution as the direct intervention of the masses into historical developments. And this is precisely what we see in Egypt. The mass strikes and the protests of workers first brought down Mubarak and have been driving on events ever since. workers and youth worldwide from the beginning had an intuitive understanding that the mass struggles in Europe are a truly historical event. Worldwide there was a deep solidarity with the Egyptian revolution and workers were euphoric and inspired by the revolutionary development in Egypt. I myself remember very well American workers during the mass protests in the US state Wisconsin just after the Egyptian revolution in 2011 carried signs saying walk like an Egyptian. They called Governor Scott Walker, they called him uh, Hosni Walker and uh, some of them even raised their shoes and like workers in Egypt demanded uh, the overthrow of the hated uh, governor of Wisconsin. Similar reactions could be seen worldwide in Germany and Europe. Throughout the world, workers followed events in Egypt. And just as two years ago, today, workers throughout the world are following events in Egypt. But um, the mood has changed. Euphoria of 2011 has uh, gone and workers are today more serious. Yesterday I had a telephone conversation with the reader of the WSWS who said 
he could no longer bear the uh, lies of official politics and media. He said, uh, in relation to Egypt and Syria, in Egypt they support a military junta massacring their own population. The release of Mubarak, who has killed thousands of people, is acceptable. But at the same time, they spread propaganda about a supposed um, gift gas, poisonous gas in Egypt by Assad, in order to prepare a military coup against the Assad government, uh, because the Western governments want to get rid of him. This is what our reader said. This shows that the rapid developments during the past two years have left deep uh, traces in the consciousness of the working class. Under the fire of events, workers have made important political experiences. All governments and political tendencies had to s state where they stand and take a position on the events in Egypt and throughout the Arab world. Uh, the imperialist governments, above all the liberal and left forces in Egypt and international, had to take a stand. And in this discussion I had yesterday, there was also a certain political um, disillusionment. How could it be different? The working class has only begun to consciously work over the experiences and to draw the necessary political confusions. It is important to understand, and I uh, stress this to that the Egyptian revolution is not a one-time event. Like all great revolutions, especially those which are deeply rooted in complex national and international processes, like the French Revolution, the revolutions of 1848-39, or the Russian Revolution, all these uh, great revolutions develop not over weeks or months, but over years. The Egyptian revolution is driven by deep objective causes, by the explosive social and political contradictions in Egypt and throughout the Middle East. To name just one figure which exemplifies the extent of the social catastrophe in Egypt. According to the UN, 40% of the Egyptian population live on less than 2 US dollars a day. The social inequality and the political contradictions in Egypt are bound up with the crisis of capitalism and are being aggravated by this crisis. On the World Socialist website, in one of our perspectives articles, we explained that the revolution is a battlefield in which different political forces come to the foreground and make clear the class interests they represent and from this standpoint the counter-revolutionary development in Egypt is a defeat for the masses but it does not mean the end of the revolution but it is represents one of its early stages. In the first phase of the revolution different social and political forces were demanding the removal of Mubarak This is made clear by this uh, picture. This is from the Tahrir Square before Mubarak was overthrown. 80 million versus uh, Mubarak, who is uh, depicted as a pharaoh. Everybody claimed to be on the side of democracy and the masses. Liberal businessmen, like the Middle East manager of Google, while Gonaim, bourgeois politicians like the former UN representative Mohammed El Baradai, leaders of the Muslim Brothers, which was the biggest but officially banned opposition movement under Mubarak, and also representatives of a better of petty bourgeois uh, forces, and even part of the military itself. The working class at this point in time was the driving force of the revolution, but it was not clear about the immense gulf, class gulf, separating the working class from all of these forces. 
In the course of the revolution, the political factions of the ruling elite in Egypt, however, were tested and had to show very clearly their position in class struggle. There was a process unfolded, which Engels in his uh, book Revolution and Counter-Revolution in Germany described in relation of the German Revolution in 1848-89, uh, 49, sorry. Uh, this is the quotation. Uh, he's reading out the quotation. In Egypt, first the military junta which took over power after Mubarak's overthrow, turned their weapons against the revolution and it became clear very quickly that the old generals of Mubarak's wanted to save as much of the old order as possible. In March 2011 they passed a law against protests and strikes and repeatedly attacked demonstrations on the Tahrir Square in Cairo. The military continued with the torture tactics of the Mubarak era <coughs> and put thousands of civilians into in front of military courts. In April 2011, the Egyptian army stormed Tahrir Square. Also, smaller demonstrations were always attacked and dissolved by the military. And the Muslim brothers, who were the largest organized opposition, the Muslim brothers won the first parliamentary and presidential elections after the overthrow of Mubarak because there had been these long years of oppression and the uh, Brotherhood had certain social institutions, there was in the beginning a certain hope that the Islamists could be an alternative to the Mubarak regime. But these illusions were quickly dissolved. The Muslim brothers tried to place their own cadre in the ruling apparatus. They demanded changes in the legal and political institutions of Egypt in order to reserve a greater part of the political power for themselves and for those parts of the bourgeoisie they represented. However, they defended the same fundamental class interests as the military themselves. Aye. Morsi, the president of the Muslim Brothers, continued the anti-worker and pro-imperialist policies of his predecessors. Immediately after his election victory, he began negotiations with the International Monetary Fund in order to get a new credit. His aim was to further liberalize the Egyptian economy and to slash uh, subsidies. That is to continue precisely the policies which the Mubarak regime had carried out for more than 30 years. At the same time he defended the interests of US imperialism in the region. The more the resistance of the working class against Morsi increased, the more Morsi tried to lean against US imperialism and to get the support of them. He was even pictured on the cover of the Time magazine, which called him the most important man in the Middle East. This was just after Israel had attacked the Gaza Strip in autumn 2012 and Mursi played an important role to organize this and to support this. And from that point in time it became clear that just like Mubarak, he was the right hand of US imperialism in the region. In the weeks before the outbreak of the mass protests on the 30th of June, Mursi more and more directly supported the imperialist intervention in Syria, which should overthrow President Bashar al-Assad and prepare a war against Iran. On a, dem on a demonstration with the, in support of Syria, 
which took place in Cairo in a football stadium. Morsi called for holy war against Assad and he declared that he would support a no-fly zone against Syria and he would also materially and morally support the Islamic opposition in Syria which was financed by the West. Morsi's open alliance with US imperialism um, created opposition amongst workers against him and the Muslim Brotherhood, Brotherhood or rather it intensified this opposition. And then on the 13th of June all this opposition exploded. According to estimates on this day between 14 and 17 million throughout Egypt had taken to the streets. This explosion of the masses of course uh, did not come out of the blue but it had been preparing for a long time. This is a statistics which demonstrates how during the past years protests and strikes among the working class in Egypt have exploded. Especially after the overthrow of Mubarak the working class more and more came forward. I will briefly explain these figures which make this very clear. In the years before the revolution, since 2004-2005, when the neoliberal wing in Mubarak's parties took over uh, Mubarak's son who was himself a banker and they began to completely sell off Egyptian economy. Strikes and protests among workers at that time began to rise. In 2003 there were 80 strikes and protests and in 2005 it was two, 222. In two, 2007 there were 580 strikes which was a doubling. Then strikes took over in, in the uh, public sector and took on a more and more political undertone. 10,000 of textile workers in Mahala al Kubra, one of the greatest uh, industrial centers in the Nile Delta uh, or throughout the Middle East went into revolt in April 2008. They destroyed posters of Mubarak throughout the city in the year 2009 that is two years before the outbreak of the revolution there were more than a thousand strikes and since the overthrow of Mubarak the strike wave further exploded. In 2012 according to the Egyptian Center of International Developments there were more than 3,800 strikes and in the first six months of 2013 it was 5,500 strikes and social protests. This entire development then of course culminated in the mass protests against Mubarak in uh, January 2011 and then in the mass demonstrations against the hated Morsi regime this year on the 30th of June. This picture shows the mass protests on the Tahrir Square against Morsi. Uh, at the beginning of my lecture I raised the question about who is responsible for the counter-revolutionary events in Egypt in order to understand how the representatives of the old regimes and imperialism managed despite this massive movement of the working class to turn back the clock of history. One must understand the class nature of the so-called liberal and left so-called organizations. The decisive role of the working class in the revolution has deeply shocked the well-to-do middle layers and their political organizations. They were horrified when they realized that the working class went far beyond their own interests. First they supported the protests against Mubarak. As I explained, but this was uh, far more because they envied the elites and not because they were in solidarity with the working class. Behind their so-called democratic demands there were more questions of lifestyle and above all their aim to get a larger piece of the cake for themselves. Deeper social, deep, they rejected 
changes of society which were to go deeper and they rejected social equality. Their aim was not the overthrow of capitalism and the abolishment of private property, but they aspire to a larger part of uh, added value which is being pressed out of the working class, surplus value. The more the working class came forward in the course of the revolution, the more these wealthy middle layers feared for their own social position. After two and a half years of massive protest and strikes, they feel that enough is enough. They support the return to a dictatorship. They think this is better it is necessary in order to defend their wealth and privileges against the danger threat of a socialist revolution. They have now decided to no longer play revolution, so to speak, and to become <coughs> an instrument of counter-revolution in order to stop the rising radicalization of the working class. They struck an alliance with the military and with elements of the former Mubarak regime. They started the so-called Tamarot uh, campaign. Uh, Tamarot means rebellion. Uh, I want to make a number of points about this. This Tamarot movement was the decisive mechanism for the military and the old regime to, can, to channel the mass movement and to use it for their own reactionary purposes. As innumerable articles in the bourgeois media make clear, Tamarot was financed and supported by elements of the former Mubarak regime. In interview with Bloomberg and the New York Times, the Egyptian billionaire and um, a friend of Mubarak, Nagib Zabiris, um, who also speaks for the World Economic Forum, he said that he had paid 28 million US dollars to Tamarot also, they were supported by General Ahmed Shafiq, the last prime minister under Mubarak, and supporter of Omar Suleiman, who has died, who was uh, for many years the uh, leader of the Egyptian secret service. The so-called liberal or left groups in Egypt, who had tried to present themselves as revolutionary pioneers for democratic right, played the decisive role to give a sort of left face to this right-wing conspiracy where they claimed that Tamarot was a movement for the continuation of the revolution and the struggle of the masses for more social and democratic rights. The real program of Tamarot was the return to a military dictatorship. The leaders of Tamarot, Mahmoud Matra and Mohammed Abdelaziz, were standing at the side of the coup leader Abdel Fattah al-Assisi when he on the 3rd of July announced the taking over of power by the military in state television. This is a photograph which makes this clear. In the state television first um, al-Sisi spoke and sh shortly after him Mahmoud Badr, a young activist who had long, for a long time worked in the campaign of El Baradei. And he repeated what Al-Sisi had said, we support the military coup. And we support the uh, taking of power by the military. After the latest uh, massacre, in which more than 600 Muslim brothers and peaceful protesters were murdered by the military. Badr declared his unconditional support for the military. He said, I cannot say anything bad about the army. He stressed, Badr stressed, that nobody, for, nobody uh, pushed him into this position. Also the Egyptian Socialist Party and the National Salvation Front, a broad alliance of liberal and so-called left forces, were involved in the coup and they aggressively supported the oppression which ensued. Just before the violent dissolution of the protest camps of the Muslim Brotherhood, 
during which hundreds of peaceful protesters were killed, amongst them women and children. Karima El Hafnavi, a leading member of the Egyptian Socialist Party, explained, This is a violent sit-in. It is the right of every government <coughs> to disband it by law. And he said that the people will do it if the government doesn't do it. I think these quotes make very clear the aggressive turn to the right by these liars. Who are, meanwhile, the most pronounced supporters of the dictatorship and the attack on protesters. On this, this, on this slide, you can see the extent of the destruction. This, on the left, is the protest camp of the Muslim Brothers in Cairo. And on the right hand, you can see what it looked like after the attack of the army and the security forces. While some of these groups uh, have supported the military regime only verbally, others of them, like the new prime minister, who is a member of the Social Democratic of Egypt, and also the minister of labor, who is the leader of the Egyptian Federation of Independent Unions. These people directly entered the transitional government which was put in place by the military and became part of it. The liberal cynic and lackey of international finance capital, Mohamed al baradei first joined the military government, but then he left and um, got out of the government because he feared a new explosion of violence by the masses but the most corrupt group which supported the military were the pseudo-left revolutionary socialists. They supported Tamarot and called the alliance as a road to completion of the revolution. They organized joint meetings with Tamarot and uh, praised the new right hand of al-Sisi, Al Mahmoud Badre. The Badre and al-Sisi were invited by them. They organized joint meetings this is documented on YouTube, and they hail these right-wing and reactionary forces, and then they celebrated the military coup as a second revolution. On the World Socialist website, we wrote in detail about this group, and it is very important to see the breathtaking turns, twists and turns of their political line in detail. In it's reading out the quote on the slide. He's still reading out the slide. Uh, there are uh, only two stable con components in the political line of the revolutionary socialists. First, it reflects the interests of U.S. imperialism. And second, it is directed against any independent political movement of the working class. In this manner, it reflects the interests of corrupt middle layers whose privileges are directly bound up with the oppression of the working class and the dominance of U.S. imperialism in the region. Many of their members, like Sami Nagib or Hassam El Hamalawi, have uh, studied at the American University in Cairo or teach there. Others of them work for NGOs financed by the West. They work for bourgeois media in Egypt or internationally. Or they're part of the union bureaucracy. 
which is now also represented in the government. I have, as I have mentioned, the uh, new Minister of Labour is the leader of the Union uh, Alliance. The deeper reason for the political bankruptcy of these forces is the fact that none of them has a program to solve the social problems confronting the masses in Egypt. The dominance of imperialism in the Middle East, mass poverty and the lack of democracy. All forces of the Egyptian bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeoisie defend the capitalist property relations and are tied by a thousand strings to imperialism and the international finance capital. They are organically hostile towards the interests of the working class and as I have made clear, in doubt, they, if in doubt, they prepare a military dictatorship to a social revolution of the working class. Uli mentioned in his introduction that behind the sharp turn to the right by those liberal and pseudo-left groups who openly support a military dictatorship and the oppression of protests, behind this are the dynamics and depths of the revolutionary developments in Egypt and internationally. During the past two years, there has been a more and more sharp differentiation between the working class and all bourgeois and petty bourgeois tendencies. It is important, and I want to stress this, to understand the consequences and implications of this movement in all clarity. International, the, since 2011, the international crisis has been continuously sharpening and we are now entering a new epoch of mass struggles. During the past years there were internationally the mass strikes and protests in Greece, Portugal and Spain as a reaction to the aggressive austerity policies of the EU in the in, also in the industrial regions of Asia like China and Bangladesh, in Israel and in the most recent time in Turkey and in Brazil. Germany is now the most socially most polarized country in Europe and after the elections we will have uh, sharp attacks on social achievements. In every country overnight a similar mass movement can erupt as in Egypt. In Germany all parties are reacting to this by moving closer together and supporting the establishment of a police state. That is quite a similar development as in Egypt where all parts of the bourgeoisie and the petty bourgeoisie are closing ranks against the working class. And can anybody doubt which role the left party would play if millions of workers took to the streets? Their positions and those of their sister parties in Egypt make very clear how they would react, that is by calling for dictatorship and violence. The quote I gave from the leader of the uh, Socialist Party in Egypt, this is a sister party of the left party. Uh, and Wolfgang Gerke, the uh, speaker of the left party for foreign affairs, uh, he has met uh, with them. We can also look at what the left party themselves are writing on the events in Egypt in order to get an impression of what role they would play in other countries including Germany. One could give numerous quotes from their media. <coughs> I just want to limit myself to this one quote which was published at the end of July in their party newspaper Neues Deutschland. I do not want to read out too many long quotes, but this is important and it is um, very, it makes things very clear. This is a document which takes p a position so clearly against democracy and in favor of supporting the Egyptian military that this just has to be looked at. He's reading out the quote.
then the authors ask what 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 would be the sense of new elections if none of the political forces has a realistic and strategic conception out of the crisis so they ask the question why should there be elections none of them has a program but they of course all have a program and then they continue it is easy to call for social justice if you have no concrete information and no calculation how to realize it and then they draw the conclusion in this document We have here an open embrace of the military coup in Egypt, the military government with all the consequences which ensue. This makes very clear the class nature of the left party. This is what they would support in Germany if mass protests break out. Let's look at Turkey. I know that comrades from the Turkey are listening for comrades from Turkey are listening to us and following this meeting, and one has to ask what would be the role of the pseudo-left organizations in Turkey if the military following mass protests against Erdogan were to carry out a coup and take over power. They would play the same role as their comrades in Egypt and they would support a Turkish version of Tamarot in order to channel the protests behind bourgeois forces and the military and to oppress them. This is an international phenomenon all these tendencies, be it the NPA in France, the left party in Germany, have supported Tamarot and have made clear which uh, side in the class struggle they are on. The course of the Egyptian revolution and the development of class relations internationally have confirmed the fundamental conceptions of Marxism and the theory of permanent revolution and in this manner they have also confirmed the work of the WSWS and the ICFI which, is play, which stands in that tradition. We are the only political tendency which fought for the building of an independent revolutionary leadership in the working class in every stage of the Egyptian revolution. The problem of the Egyptian revolution is not that the working class would not, were not prepared to fight because the working class again and again went onto the offensive but without a revolutionary party the working class was disorientated and unprepared and was not able to see through the latest reactionary maneuvers of the pseudo left the ICFI since the first uprising two years ago has stressed that the Egyptian working class cannot realize its interests and demands without taking state power and transforming the economy in a socialist manner. This perspective has been vindicated. The decisive task is not only in Egypt but worldwide to draw the lessons from the experiences of the Egyptian revolution and to prepare for the coming class troubles. In our perspective article on the release of Mubarak, which was published on the German WSWs yesterday, uh, we write Uh, this is the quote. This is the reading out the file. Uh,
I think the brutal brutality of counter-revolution in Egypt and the preparations of war against Syria, which take on ever more dramatic forms, underline the urgent necessity of this perspective. Therefore, I want to appeal on all assembled here and on all our listeners online to join this struggle. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Comrade Johannes, for this um, very thorough lecture, which has addressed uh, many important points. We now have the possibility to answer questions. Maybe we should first ask our international audience if there are any questions or remarks on the lecture. We want to make use of this opportunity of that Johannes is here and can answer questions. How is our international? Of course, you can read. I would like to give you an overview of our online audience. We are meeting here in Berlin, but we have many people online. There are 116 re registered um, users at the moment, where at some places dozens of people have come together in order to listen to the lecture and the look at the slides. Such meetings are taking place in Munich, Leipzig, Hamburg, Frankfurt and Essen and internationally we have groups of comrades who uh, are, have been listening to the lecture together. We know based on the registration that there are groups of listeners in Switzerland, in Britain, in France, in Turkey, in Romania, in the US, Sri Lanka, the Philippines and in Australia. These are the ones we know about. We cannot uh, monitor everything in detail. But we did have today an international meeting and now there are, we have the first comments coming in from the internet audience. We have here an English question by an... He asks how the bloody counter-revolution, what effect will it have on the revolutionary Then there's a question from Munich. Uh, they ask about the role of the German government during the oppression of the Egyptian working class and also they inquire about the role of the left party uh, in these bloody events. Then we have another question about the role of the German um, trade union alliance. Then there is a brief question about the position of the revolutionary socialists today. How do they, what do they say about their previous positions? These are the questions we have had online so far. Maybe we can reply to these questions and while we do that, our online audience can should feel free to post more questions or remarks.
I would like to start with the last question. Which position do the revolutionary socialists take today? On our website, we have had a number of articles on this. They, of course, try to... Um, they distance themselves from the military now. They try to cover their tracks. They pretend that they never supported Mursi and never supported the military. And that during the past two and a half years, it had always been their role. This has been, they've done this continuously. They covered up for their own opportunist maneuvers and their alliances. If they were honest about this, they could not play the role they're playing for the Egyptian bourgeoisie, and that is to oppress, to prevent an independent movement of the working class. In every stage of the revolution, they subordinate the working class to one or the other wing of the bourgeoisie. That has been their role throughout. I think it is interesting, and I want to stress this, their line is always rather directly bound up with the line of US imperialism. When the military was implemented, they supported it, and when the US took a turn, they then promoted a compromise between Mursi and the military in order to stabilize the situation in Egypt. Then they supported Mursi, and when it was impossible to keep up Mursi due to the resistance in the working class, they took a turn again and went back to supporting the military. The imperialists, of course, are worried. If you read the uh, statements of the e European Union and the, Pent uh, the um, foreign ministry in the US, they fear that there will be a new explosion in the working class. They are worried. And they are preparing for an imperialist war in Syria. And therefore they want a an ally in the region. They support the military government, but they would prefer a compromise with the Muslim Brotherhood because they hope that on this basis they could uh, stabilize the situation. The revolutionary situ socialists reflect this line of US imperialism by calling for a so-called third road. They try to distance themselves from both the military and the Muslim Brotherhood and say that there must be a third way, a third alliance, a new alliance, independent of both forces. And on this basis, they attempt to uh, prepare for the next wave of struggles and to organize a regroupment to put up the next trap for the working class. <coughs> if you look at the class character of this organization, one has to demonstrate and draw out the role they've played since the beginning of the revolution. We have to de demonstrate to workers the real class nature of this group. The fact that they have supported Tamarut is not an accident. I have tried to make clear that this is bound up with their original class interests. Also, their support for Mursi was not an accident. They never, of course, spell this out. They cannot do that. These are very deeply rooted class issues, which are the basis of their orientation. They speak for wealthy layers of the middle class in Egypt, well-off layers, who fear a socialist revolution because it would be directed against their own privileges, which they have won in the framework of capitalism. I have tried to draw out that they have close relations with US imperialism. They work in NGOs financed by the West. They work in the trade union bureaucracy in Egypt, which is also financed by Western powers. 
And on this basis, of course, they are not able to play an independent role, even if they claim to do so. And therefore, they are calling themselves revolutionary socialists is uh, the peak of cynicism. Their political line in the Egyptian revolution shows that these are counter-revolutionary capitalists and not revolutionary socialists. The question on the role of the German government and the left party and the unions are closely bound up with the same issues. The German Trade Union Alliance works very closely with the forces I have named. They support, for example, the project of the building of independent, so-called independent unions, which is a project also of the revolutionary socialists. Sommer, the leader of the German unions, has directly after the mass protests had begun, uh, the head of the German trade unions called for the building of independent unions. The bourgeoisie internationally understood very well that you need a new uh, instrument to control the working class in Egypt, that is new unions. In order to control the working class, the state unions under Mubarak were totally discredited and the entire revolution one must recall on the 25th of January 2011 took place in a direct confrontation with the unions. Hossein Mugabe, the leader of the state unions in Egypt, he was directly involved in the, so in the battle on Tahir Square after the first mass protests and he uh, was a suck he was among the thugs attacking the protesters. Workers attacked uh, quarters of the state unions. There was a direct class confrontation between the workers on the one side and the state unions on the other side. And on that basis, imperialism, uh, and the unions here are part of imperialism, tried everything to build a new bureaucracy so-called independent unions, they transferred monies to Egypt. Uh, also the AFL-CIO attempted to create a new bureaucracy. It is interesting that workers reject this quite vehemently. The independent unions have not been able to gain a foothold among workers because workers understand very well the role they play. It is the repeated attempt to build new state unions to replace the old ones and the leader of the independent unions in Egypt is now a labor minister and this makes very clear that these are unions are not at all independent but are just as dependent on the uh, government as the just as much as the old had been the German government has played a similar role as all imperialist governments in relation to Egypt. If you recall, as long as possible they supported Mubarak. They had uh, collaborated with the regime for more than 30 years. They were shocked when the mass protests broke out. They tried to hold on to Mubarak. There were statements in which they said that the situation in Egypt is under control and so on. And when it became clear that Mubarak could not be uh, upheld, they then tried to support the Muslim Brotherhood or a military dictatorship and justified this by saying that this was now a democratic transition, a transition, transition to democracy. This was the slogan of the Egyptian bourgeoisie and their imperialist backers. But the real interest of German imperialism or the reactionary nature and role of German imperialism in supporting the counter-revolution in Egypt becomes clear, became very clear during the past week, months and weeks in the past weeks when the German Foreign Minister Westerwelle met with representatives of the new transitional government
uh, they uh, openly back the military. In the beginning, they Westerwelle, the German foreign minister, also tried to meet Mursi, but then he dropped this. And by now it has become very clear that all Western governments, including the German government, support the military junta because it uh, oppresses the protests of the workers. German ha Germany has very close economic relationships with Egypt. There are hundreds of companies active in Egypt. They employ thousands of workers. Germany is the third largest trade partner of Egypt. <coughs> and the German government wants stability in Egypt. And if it takes violence to achieve this, that's fine and necessary. And against this background, one must see the role of the left party. It is a party of German imperialism. And it represents the role of the federal government of Germany. Uh, maybe we can return to the quote I read out. They support the military government very explicitly. And this makes clear the point Uli made. These are the forces who are needed in a situation in which the working class intervenes into events. And a revolutionary development must be oppressed. The tradition of the left party, which comes out of Stalinism, is ideally suited uh, to that. And this is why they react so aggressively to mass protests of the working class just as the Egyptian Socialist Parties, which is the most aggressive force calling for violence against the workers. To the first question, that is, the uh, effects of the counter-revolution in the events in Egypt on the consciousness of workers internationally. I think this is a very much a political question. I have tried to make the point that now, of course, there is a certain um, mood of uh, disorientation or lack of orientation. Two years ago, there was a general euphoria, but now it has become clear that spontaneous mass protest alone will not suffice to bring about any changes. And now the working class is confronted with a task to draw the lessons from the events and to prepare for the coming developments and in to the extent that the working class achieves this with the, uh, the essential help of our party which explains to workers what has happened and we are the party which gives a political orientation and if we succeed in doing this uh, it becomes possible for workers to develop a new kind of optimism on a much higher political level of political understanding. The developments in Egypt show that a revolutionary development does not simply come out of the thinking of the masses at this or that moment, but this mo movement was caused by very deep objective causes and contradictions and insofar as the crisis of capitalism and social inequality sharpens worldwide such revolutionary developments will automatically ensue with ever greater speed internationally and on that basis maybe I can if such a development develops the working class can really make great leaps in, conscious, in their consciousness and achieve political clarity. I think the fact that today so many participants have registered online and are interested in the political lessons of these dramatic events, I think this, this uh, proves that the working class wants to know the truth and wants political clarity. And in the coming period, as more such mass struggles and develop, we have a great responsibility, but also a possibility as a revolutionary movement to 
build the revolutionary leadership in the working class and to achieve clarity amongst the working class and the WWS is in the center of this work. Now the a lot of comments are coming. Also, we have further questions. I will sum up the questions. Maybe we can briefly address them. One question which is posed again and again is the question of the connection between the events in Syria, the latest uh, danger of war in Syria, and developments in Egypt. This is a question which is posed again and again. Another question from England is whether more can be said about the connections between Tamarot and the revolutionary socialists. Another question is how the soldiers can be won for the uh, cause of the workers in Egypt. Uh, then uh, the question about the role the Muslim Brothers are going to play in the future development of the revolution, what is behind the religious conflicts, for example, the attacks on the Copt. And then the question how the ICFI had intervened in Egypt, are there supporters in Egypt, are there sympathizing groups in Egypt. And a final question, is there outside of the WS, WS any sources one can trust in, sources of information? So Johannes is replying to the question relating to Syria. This underlines the reactionary nature of the pseudo-lefts. Immediately after the oppression of the protests in Egypt, imperialism goes on to the offensive with an enormous propaganda offensive in order to prepare the next war against Syria. I would like to briefly go into these events. The entire propaganda about the attacks of the Assad regime with gas. If you look at the facts and uh, analyze them, it is rather likely and clear that if such a attack has taken out it taken place it was done by the rebels secondly the UN inspectors are coming into the country and on the same day uh, such an attack takes place very close to the hotel used by the UN inspectors and if you ask the question who profits from this attack it is quite clear, it is in the interest of the pro-imperialist opposition. Syrian State TV yesterday published um, 
uh, quite extensive reports um, Syrian soldiers okay, were brought to hospitals who were also attacked by uh, gas and it is all, all indications are that this was a provocation organized by the imperialists and the pro-imperialist rebels and if you look at the entire uh, history of those forces in the Middle East it is quite clear that these forces are quite capable of organizing such atrocities uh, with the support of Western secret services at the same time this underlines the counter-revolutionary role of the pseudo left what is who claim that what is happening in Syria is a revolution if you look back at the war in Libya this was also a direct reaction to the Egyptian revolution it was an attempt by US imperialism to make use of this situation in order to enormously aggressively and brutally um, forward their own interests carry out a regime change on, in the name of human rights this is what happened in Libya and this is what they aspire to do in Syria and now after the military junta in Egypt tries to stabilize the situation with violent means imperialism tries on this basis to um, carry out their aggressive plans with ever greater speed the, so it is decisive to draw the political lessons and to fight for a socialist perspective so that the working class in the Middle East can unite against these reactionary regimes and against imperialism I think this is the necessity which emerges very clearly and much depends on the working class here in the West in the Western countries because in a war against Syria there's a potential a war in Syria carries the potential to uh, spread throughout the region the Iranian government today warned of a attack of the West and said that a red line would be crossed if this were to happen and it is quite clear that a military co a military blow against Syria would cause a massive war throughout the Middle East which has the potential of igniting a third world war in, if China and Russia are being drawn in so the question of the building of our party in order to unite and mobilize the working class in the struggle against war and counter-revolution this is absolutely uh, crucial another question was the connection between Tamarot and the revolutionary socialists I would like to repeat the point if we talk about these various groupings liberals and pseudo-lefts and also the Nasserite uh, groupings in Egypt these are different political tendencies of one and the same social layer these are wealthy uh, middle class uh, people who are dissatisfied who were dissatisfied with the Mubarak regime because they could not directly participate in the uh, uh, exploitation of the working class but they are totally hostile to a socialist revolution they have always it is so it, they have always been one alliance from their this has sort of flowed organically from their class interests all the groups who support Tamarot be it El Baradei or the revolutionary socialists the uh, Kefaya movement this is a milieu which over years has built close uh, connections amongst each other and they are also uh, closely tied to imperialism 
on the 25th of January, it, briefly, just before the uh, outbreak of the mass protest, they published a joint statement with the National Salvation Front of El Baradai. I made the point that Mahmoud al Batra, the leader of Tamarut, had long worked in the El Baradei campaign. So these groups and activists have been collaborating for years. They have been publishing joint statements and so on. Just to uh, go into this statement, they never called for the overthrow of Mubarak. Their main slogan was uh, free elections, more democracy, more... Um, but uh, anyway, they did not call for the overthrow of Mubarak. They never called for a revolution from the beginning. They wanted to integrate into the Egyptian regime and into Egyptian capitalism. They wanted to have a larger a democratic sort of piece of the pie for themselves, but within the regime. And they have now achieved this by uh, joining hands with the junta in attacking and oppressing the working class protests. And in this question, on that on that basis, they all supported Tamarot. I could uh, the National Salvation Front was uh, involved in this. Uh, who was uh, this? This movement was um, founded by. Uh, long-standing Egyptian politicians who had played a big role in the regime and they united when they found out, when they noticed that Mursi was being discredited amongst workers and they uh, developed this Tamarot campaign as a left cover for a right-wing conspiracy playing the role to channel the mass protest behind the military the revolutionary socialists who invited Badra and Tamarut to their headquarters and organized joint meetings with them. The revolutionary socialists, in the name of socialism, gave this Tamarut campaign a left cover and painted it in socialist colors in order to make it difficult for workers to see through this maneuver, which was financed by Egyptian billionaires and supported by old representatives of the Mubarak regime. So there are close connections between all these forces. And now the revolutionary socialists, of course, try to cover their tracks and distance themselves from this role they played, because they are already preparing for the next maneuver, which might become necessary as soon as the workers, based on the entire dynamic of events, will again take to mass strikes and mass protests and workers must understand uh, this is what we are trying to achieve with the website be ex by writing sharp polemics and explaining the class nature of these forces so that workers can understand what they represent break with them politically and understand that the revolutionary socialists Uh, have to be uh, disposed with and a new party, a workers' party has to be built. This is the significance of our website. The question was how do we intervene in Egypt? And well, we do this by making a daily analysis on our website of the class struggle in Egypt and to, by analyzing the various class forces and giving workers an understanding of political developments and of course our entire historical perspective the Trotskyist perspective of permanent revolution we try to bring this into the Egyptian working class and on this basis we create clarity and it, we strive to build an Egyptian section of the ICFI 
And if you look at our work during the past two and a half years, and if you look at the reactions we get and the response we get from Egypt, we have indeed made an important development. And I think the situation we have now is that these questions are becoming more and more direct and of immediate significance. We get very serious people writing in from Egypt. I do not want to uh, go into too much detail because we live in the era of NSA, so I do not want to name names. But we do have a growing number of people writing to us in the Arab world. We uh, translate a lot into Arabic and if you can help in this work, please contact us because these are the tasks uh, we are confronting. I think these were the main questions. Uh, Uli would like to uh, make a remark. Uh, thank you, Comrade Johannes. This is Uli. Uh, thank you for the uh, thorough replies to the questions. Before we end our online meeting, And uh, comrades uh, will continue discussing amongst themselves in uh, smaller circles. I would like to take up one remark and come back, return to the first question. The, uh, the question was put, posed, asked about the effects of the present events that is the establishment of a military dictatorship, a brutal dictatorial regime. Which effect will that have on the working class, not only in Egypt but internationally, if you compare it with the effect of the revolutionary movement in early 2011? Must we now not expect the opposite uh, reaction, that is, a kind of disillusionment and uh, back movement back. I think this would be very superficial to see it in this formal manner. What has uh, happened in Egypt during the past two and a half years and what is presently taking place is a very important strategic uh, experiences, experience through which the international working class is passing. Nothing is now as it was two years ago. First of all, it has become clear how strong, how much the development of the working class has proceeded. The statistics by, presented by Johannes were very impressive. There was an explosive development of strike movements and this demonstrates that the movement of the working class is being driven by very deep and objective problems with which millions of workers are confronted every day, not only in Egypt and not only in the Middle East, but on a world scale. This um, beginning of a new phase of international revolution created a situation in which all political tendencies demonstrated their true colors and demonstrated the position they are going to take in the coming development of the revolution. It is a, what is important is that it became clear that those forces who called themselves left, revolutionary and so on and so forth, that under conditions of this uh, beginning of a revolution, they very, very fast orient towards the right and become vehement defenders not only of the bourgeois state but also of a military dictatorship against the working class. This is a political experience not only in Egypt but internationally. This takes place on a world scale and I think this must be studied and discussed very, very carefully.
What is the reason for this? Johannes, in a very uh, concise manner, summed up the historical parallels. He uh, uh, referred to Marx and Engels in 1848 in Germany and he demonstrated that at that time it already became visible that when the proletarian revolution develops and the working class intervenes into social developments, these petty bourgeois layers go to the turn to the right with enormous speed and that therefore a party upholding the political independence of the working class in a political and programmatic manner is of enormous significance. This is what has become clear in Egypt. An elementary uprising is not enough. Enthusiasm and radicalism is not enough. Millions of workers on the, throughout the world realize this. What is necessary is political and programmatic orientation and leadership. And uh, it becomes very clear how important our own intervention, that is the intervention of the World Socialist website, how important that is, especially during the two and a half years in Egypt. We do not simply speak about the building of a new political leadership in a general way and that the working class need their own independent leadership. Through our analysis on the WICWS we have demonstrated that there is such an international leadership in the form of the CADO working on the WSWS. This political differentiation was an objective process but there was no other political organization besides ours which was conscious of this process and uncovered it and developed a positive program and I think this is of great significance because it demonstrates the enormous strength of our party. It is not only able to understand these very complex developments in the Middle East but also has a political perspective for the working class as an independent political force and I think this is of great significance. I do not want to repeat what Johannes has already said. For our election campaign in Germany and the intervention we are carrying out here in Berlin, all this is of great uh, significance because what became clear is that the building of our party means to draw the politic to have a political and theoretical a struggle against the so-called left, the left party and their pseudo-left appendages, we have to intensify and sharpen this struggle. And if we do this, we will find a great response amongst workers. And I think what took place today is a very important step in the development of our work. We have not only an international perspective, we have begun to act as an international party, so to say, uh, lead the discussion in real time and this is significant. The fact that we this reflects uh, the great um, attractiveness which our party will have for workers internationally. I would therefore like to thank again our lecturer Johannes Stern. It was a very important and informative uh, afternoon. I would like to thank our international friends, guests and audience and participants in the discussion. And I propose that everywhere where comrades have come together, you should continue the discussion. You can always email us or contact us in any other manner so that we continue the discussion uh, of the lecture and the questions which were raised. Thank you very much. We would like to close the movement at this uh, at the meeting and continue the discussion in smaller groups. Just one last remark before everybody goes offline. We, in Berlin now, before we return home, we will have a collection 
uh, I would like to call on all uh, comrades uh, listening to do the same and to discuss uh, the fact that uh, our election campaign costs money, as everybody knows. Uh, we do not have uh, donors uh, uh, among billionaires. Uh, as uh, Tamarot in, in Egypt. We are uh, very proud that we are independent and that our policies, our party is not dependent on, is financially independent, but this means that we have to collect um, money in the campaign and everybody listening also outside of Germany. I, we have a lot of plans in this campaign. We need every cent. And if you can contribute, you should do so. Thank you very much. Now we have applause.